But given that this is the start of Global Entrepreneurship Week, I'd like to uh, welcome up now just to say a little, a few words about Global Entrepreneurship Week, and then maybe to, to start off the questioning. So uh, give a warm welcome to Andrew Devonport. Uh, thank you very much, Matthew. I feel I've walked into a masterclass on confidence and uh, scale. So I will uh, keep my remarks brief so we can get back to, uh, to talking about those things. Um, this is a great place to be ending the first day of Global Entrepreneurship Week 2012, such an, such an inspiring historic venue that is at the cutting edge of modern business, acting as it does as a leading hub for business support and intellectual property advice. <clears throat> Now, I should tell you something very briefly about YBI. We work in 35 countries around the world, helping people who need the help start their own business. And um, it's a great privilege for us to be host of Global Entrepreneurship Week for the second year running. It's been a fantastic year um, uh, so far, and I'm delighted to be able to announce that this year's campaign will see a record-breaking 3,000 events uh, around the country, which will involve 300,000 uh, people, so roughly a thousand times this auditorium, I think, um, which is 30% um, more than, than last year. <clears throat> now, hosting GW, we get a unique view of the different kinds of organizations working to support enterprise around the UK, from schools and colleges, regional organizations, incubators, business parks, voluntary groups, socially minded business, and apparently even the odd exceptional library. <clears throat> One hears a lot about the entrepreneurial ecosystem with good reason. A flourishing entrepreneurial ecosystem provides efficient and effective support to business creators wherever they are on their journey. For enterprise supporters and promoters like myself, that has to be our goal. In a world of very finite resources, the government, the private sector, the individual, and organizations like YBI can do more to collaborate. Building an entrepreneurial culture providing educational support and access, promoting networks is the job of enterprise supporters. GEW um, does these things, um, brings them into focus, <clears throat> and it's only worth, worth it if it makes a meaningful difference to its beneficiaries. <clears throat> so we're here tonight to limit the number of times people feel compelled to reinvent the wheel. And the best way to do so is to learn from those who have experience. <clears throat> the vast majority of businesses, new businesses in the world, are started up with family, capital, in family, with family know-how. In the YBI network, we replicate these uh, conditions for young people who don't have such opportunities. It means that mentoring is a critical component of support. It means that we're constantly nagging the government and banks to recognize the risk-reducing qualities of non-financial support. An entrepreneur with a good mentor is an entrepreneur with collateral. Now, recently, YBI held its annual Young Entrepreneur of the Year competition. Competitors were drawn from our 35 countries and our network of our network, and the winner was a fellow named Naibu Yu uh, from China. And now, Naibu Yu has an amazing business in educational software. His business enables teachers to provide real-time customized curriculums to each student to to so that they teach so that, the, that you spend your time learning what you don't know or find difficult. Sounds great for the teacher, great for the parent, and possibly a nightmare for the child. <coughs> um, but he founded this business with nothing um, but an idea, of a small, uh, idea and a small loan and a mentor in 2008. It now employs 200 people with revenues of $20 million and an annual growth rate off the charts. So I asked Naibo how he was going to continue to grow, and he responded by slowing down. <coughs> he explained that in the rush to continuously grow, Entrepreneurs sometimes forget to take time to consolidate their business before focusing on where they go next. So, um, if I may, um, to kick off tonight's debate, uh, and in the spirit of pass it on theme of this year's GEW, my question to our esteemed panel tonight is about dealing with growth. <clears throat> what were the key growth-related challenges you have faced in your business, and how have you addressed them? Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Great stuff. And, um, and just to let you know that, uh, reassure you, you mentioned China and we've had a tweet in from, uh, a message in from, we are celebrating Global Entrepreneurship Week in Pakistan, says Tausif Zaman. Interesting ideas are popping up. How can we collaborate? So the word is spreading. Well done, Andrew. Thank you. 
Great stuff. Okay, uh, who would like to tackle Andrew's question about what's the, been the, ma the most challenging moments of growth in your journey so far? Maybe, Stephen, you can uh, talk yeah. about that for a moment. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I, I think growth is always what we're all looking for. You know, you start a business with an idea that you're going to gonna survive initially and then grow after that. It's interesting to note just... Uh, a point that at the British Library we have an amazing success rate at mentoring businesses and uh, helping businesses succeed. Our failure rate is something like one in ten, which is an almost exact reversal of the national failure rate. So uh, it's uh, you know we've got a very high success rate here of mentoring businesses. So it's important. Um, with with regards to growth, I think the big challenge I think initially for businesses is to focus on putting your money back into your business. I mean, I don't know whether Charlie and, and other people here have thought about, uh, uh, you know, have the same experience, but for, for us, the concentration is to make sure that you grow your business by reinvesting back in initially. Because if what you do is you start off, you can't grow that business if you suddenly go out and spend money on non-essential things. Um, you don't, maybe you don't necessarily need to go and spend the money you've just made last week on a whole new Apple uh, um, complete integrated system in the office, maybe you can make do without, mm -hmm. and invest that money back in growth. Don't go out and rent that flash car, invest it in machinery. Don't go on holiday. In, posh, you, everyone needs a break, but don't go and spend the money. Spend the money on your business and go on holiday when your business is working. Mm -hmm. So to, to fund growth organically, because going out and borrowing money at the moment isn't easy. And uh, getting investors involved, investors ask questions, we ask questions, and people come to us. And I want to see when people come to us and they're talking about would we be interested, I want to see people that are saying, you know, you know we don't, we're going to put this money into what? Into something that's going to help generate sales. Because you generate growth by generating sales, make no mistake about that. With no sales, you have no business. Great. Charlie, what's been the most difficult? transition that you've had to make in the business uh, in terms of as you've grown it yeah, and the um, bit that's challenged you personally the most? Yeah, well, as uh, Steve said there, um, we certainly uh, put the money back in the business, um, you know, to, to keep it running and that. And uh, my answer to it was to employ more sort of Charlies, if you think, you know, um, to get more of myself out there doing the job. And, uh, you know, so by employing more people, obviously meant more sales, more growth. For me, you know, uh, we can't be a success air business um, without, you know, the more people we employ, the more tradespersons on the road, um, you know, is, is where we bring in obviously our income. And, um, you know, as I said, we've, we have 200 people on board now and uh, still growing. And for, for me, the hardest challenge in certainly my business is, you know, who you employ, you know, staff. And uh, it's probably something that, you know, a lot of people agree with and have had the same mm. problem. And, and the good news is, you know, there is some good people out there. There is uh, people that want to succeed in life and, and do well. And, um, you know, if you can get them on board with you, then uh, it's a winner. Dermot, was there a, a moment, or, or indeed you, Orla, when you felt that the, this was going to develop from being a, you know, beautiful but small business into one that really needed much more professionalising, much more you know, systems and the like within it? I, I think we always, at least I did always think big, but acted small. You know, for example, we ran our business from our, you know, from our flat in Wandsworth for two years. We didn't pay rent, you know. It, when, when the goods were delivered for House of Fraser, remember, they used to be delivered at 11. If I didn't turn that around by 5, there was no sitting room. There was, there was no television that night. And, and that was keeping costs under control. Fixed costs under control was paramount in the beginning. Mm. Then, but the one thing I really thought about was the answer to this question is, is really partnerships. And who do you form your partnerships with? And the first big challenge to us was to find a factory that we could work with, that a factory that would actually work with us. And at the time, they were doing Burberry. They had a massive Burberry line. And somehow, we persuaded this man up in Norwich to make our handbags. And then from there, we learned all the skill and, and the 30, 40 years of experience from his people, which we were able to take into our DNA and into our business. Mm. 
And that, that was a major, major break at that particular stage. But it's about the partnerships with your customers, partnerships with your suppliers, and then ultimately finance is always going to be a problem. So you've got to have a partnership with, with the person who's giving you finance, which is your bank manager. Mm. And um, we went through four <coughs> banks to get to where we are now. And, um, but we got there, and that, that's very, very important as well. Great. I th thank you very much, all of you. I think it's time to get the audience. We've got loads of questions online, but we mustn't forget the, uh, the people in front of us. So who'd like to kick off with questions? And uh, I believe there are some mics around. Are there some mics around? There's a lady at the front. Uh, you may have to speak loudly. Um, Right, that's a great question, and also it, it relates to one that we've had online as well about in the early days, what are the, the biggest mistakes that entrepreneurs make? So uh, any, any uh, setbacks so far, Sam? Anything that you've tried out and thought, oops, but um, you've pushed through? The mistakes probably are the things that I haven't done and thought maybe that I should have done, um, and it's just really being too scared or too nervous to make the mistakes. Um, for me, it was definitely I lived at home, lived with my parents, and at a young age, it's excellent time to make mistakes because it's not going to be life-changing for you. If you get to sort of 40, 50 years old when you've got a mortgage, you've got people to care for, and you actually have to do things in life which, if you don't have money coming in, it's a real issue. Whereas for me, it was sort of, um, I was living at home with my parents so I could make mistakes. Um, I knew that I was always going to come home to a warm, comfy house and always have food on the table because I could make those mistakes and know that they're always going to be there supporting for me. So. I have definitely made mistakes along the way, and if anyone's sort of worried about making mistakes, don't, because it's the things that you learn from, and it's the mistakes that I've learned from to make my business what it is today. Yeah, let's have a, let's have a, quick, a quick whiz on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, something quick. Um, yeah, we nearly went bust in the last recession, I think, in sort of uh, 1990, and the uh, mistake really was, um, I don't think I was serious enough about the business. We never had no structure in place, and um, I felt I could do everything myself, so, you know, I don't know really any successful businesses that have not made mistakes to get where you are today. The good news about it is that if you do survive them mistakes, um, you come out a lot stronger for it, and certainly uh, you don't make them mistakes again. Mm. And uh, any, any particular ones that you reflect on, Stephen, that you thought, actually, it was terrible at the time, but I learned a lot from it? Uh, yeah, loads. <laughs> <laughs> it um, we, well, one is uh, ke keeping your eye on your own business. This is uh, keeping your eye on your business. This is my succinct answer to it. You have to watch your own business regardless of who you employ because if you don't watch it, eventually someone else will and that person will be an administrator. And the, the, my point of this is that uh, we had a business, where a property business at the time, where we were building a large block of flats and we employed the wrong person to do the job. We didn't watch it. I was focused. We've got over seven, I don't know how many it is, but it's 70, 60 or 70 projects worldwide. And I didn't watch it closely enough and the people around me didn't watch it closely enough. And we let one guy go rampant with running a business not being closely watched. And what he succeeded in doing was losing a seven million quid in about four and a half months. Mm -hmm. And, the, you know, we survive, I mean, that business survive. But the point is, if you don't focus and you don't watch your business, you will end up in trouble. Mm. Uh, ultimately, you will end up in trouble. And can I just finish this point? Mm. There's one real point about focus, and it's what I call you've got to have a leopard moment. And a leopard moment is this. In the jungle, a female leopard watches her prey, focuses on it with her cubs in the bush, she watches that prey totally, with no blinking. When the moths realise the female leopard is hunting, they come out the sky and they drink from her eyeball. And she doesn't blink and she doesn't fit, flinch. And the reason is she focuses on her prey and she gets the prey and that night the cubs eat. If you don't do that with your business, you will fail. You have to focus on your business. In, in our case, with so many projects, I take a file out, I focus on it. If the phone rings, much to sometimes some of my uh, colleagues and friends' dismay, I don't answer it. And the reason I don't do anything till I finish that file, and then I put that file to one side, and then I take another file, and then I deal with that. And you have to focus. So my mm -hmm. ultimate answer is 
focus on your business. Don't allow someone else to run it for you. Great, great answer. Thank you all. Thank you for those. Um, I'd like to turn to a couple of questions online related to entering new markets. And, and two for you, actually, Orla. One says, have you ever thought about expanding your brand into a different market, for example, children's wear or men's wear? And the other one related, how does a brand like yours enter a new market in the current economic climate? But altogether entering new markets mm -hmm. and whether you've thought about expanding it beyond where you are now to those degrees? Well, we've, we, I mean, in the past five years, we've entered quite a few new markets. Mm. And I suppose the one thing I would say is it takes time to, to kind of plan and develop the product for a new market. So, it, it, you know, you have to kind of plan a year in advance, really, to get product out there and, you know, to sell it. You know, as we've, we've just launched a homeware, which we started talking about, uh, I suppose, about a year ago. But, you know, you, you, really, you really have to, I suppose, have, have everything kind of set up. You have to know where you're going to make it. You have to know who you're going to mm. sell it to. You know, you have to really establish that there is a market for it. Mm. Uh, but knowing, I mean, the, the, that particular question about children's wear and men's mm. wear, I mean, the, the, yeah, I can see your reaction from it. There are some markets that, for you, feel Ch comfortable and yeah. some that I mean, feel less wear. so. Children's wear is one we have spoken about and we probably at some point will do it. It's just, mm. you can't do everything at the same time. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're, we're currently, you know, working on so many different things at the moment. I only mm. really want to, want to do something when yeah. I'm absolutely ready. Uh, we've, we, but we have, we've started in a way, we've done children's books mm. and, uh, you know, we're talking about how maybe that can probably develop into something a bit more. Yeah, great. We worked to a five-year plan, and the big decision was menswear versus homeware. And it came down, and, and homeware was... More, more logical for us. Yeah, the one we did. Yeah. And that's what we focused on. Yeah, great. Um, who's next with a, a question in the audience? And we do have some mics. So, uh, uh, right, there's a gentleman here. If you could wait for the mic, that'll make sure that it gets broadcast properly. Thank you very much. Well, my question is about finances. Uh, basically, when you are growing, uh, starting your own business, most of the ent entrepreneurs have facing problem to reach money to fund the plan. Uh, I mean, you need to invest a lot of money in promotion and adverts. Mm. So how do you deal that even if you don't have sale record to show to the, to the bank that you are a successful business? How do you convince the financial side that you are the right guy to have the money. Yeah, yeah. well, it's, it's the big one, isn't it? And uh, there is uh, questions online about this, about, and actually developing it on, um, questions about what if your business requires quite a lot of funding at the start? A number of you have talked about self-funding at the start, but some businesses do require you know, major upfront investment in the early stages. So let's, uh, let's e each of you have a, a, a shot at this about um, persuading and working on uh, getting finance as an, uh, as an early stage entrepreneur. Dermot, um, you first. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'd say plan, plan and plan again, you know, and, and make sure that every plan you do has at least three scenarios, you know, good, best, better. And also plan for when things go wrong. Uh, the key thing for me is margin and to make sure that the margin is flowing through the business plan and that you're actually spending that money correctly. So it's, uh, I'm lucky in that I spent time in working for GKN and it was just ingrained in us that everything had to get a 40% margin, mm -hmm. absolute minimum or it wasn't looked at. And we, we've always had that rule. And, we, and you'd apply those rule, that rule even to an early stage business trying to get its, its you know, self off the ground. You know, you have to show that kind of data in the plan. You've got to be profitable. You know, and even if you're going to make a loss in year one, you've got to show why you're making that loss and why you're going to make a profit in year two. And, and you've got to sort of follow it through. And um, you can't be over ambitious too. You've got to take a really, really conservative view on, on your business plan, because the bankers are going to be uh, unbelievably conservative, particularly in the present climate. Stephen. Yeah, um, uh, I'll give some what I consider real-time answers to this. I agree totally with, what, with, with everything that you said there. 
Um, I, uh, the real, my real-time answer to this is, is if you're a small business and you're looking to raise money and you need 20, 30,000 quid, basically that's what a lot of people are starting out, you know, that's the sort of money, we're not talking millions necessarily. Um, there are various ways you can go about raising that money, uh, um, and I'll just list a couple. One is, uh, because it might give practical help to the people listening, one is um, crowdfunding. Um, the cloud funding is excellent, is where you, uh, sorry, crowdfunding I meant, I've got iPhones on my mind, sorry about <laughs> that. Start again, crowdfunding. Um, uh, crowdfunding, the way it operates basically is that you go out to a crowd predominantly on the internet and you are going to ask that crowd to invest in your project or your business deal. Um, it has its problems. One is uh, plagiarism, people copying your idea, because by nature you're going out to the general public and you, you can't get them all to sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, for those that don't know what that is. Um, it, it's just not practical. So it has its dangers, but it has its good side, because if you've got, say, a particular business that might appeal to a large amount of people that you might be able to access through the net, there is a possibility you could raise your money that way. So that's one thing you can do. Secondly, you can come to an investor who might just put the money into your business for a share of the action. Um, you know, we, this is the sort of thing we look at. Um, and, and I agree entirely with what Dermot said. The problem, you, you're going to have to give them a proper plan. They're not going to be very happy about funding your business if you don't know your business. You've got to, I don't want people coming to me and asking me how they should run their business. I want them to tell me how they're going to run it first, and then I can maybe help them enhance that. But they have to have an idea themselves. If they want to have a plumbing business, being a plumber is a good start. You know, let's be honest about it, because Charlie understands his business totally. Good example of someone that's focused on something throughout his career and made a fantastic success of it. Um, you can go on uh, the BBA website, uh, British Bankers Association website, uh, just put BBA, I think Bankers, Bankers, British Bankers Association, yeah. into the Google strap line. And there are quite a lot of grants available around the UK mm. uh, where you'd be surprised how you can raise money that you don't necessarily have to pay back, providing you can provide a case to them, which goes back to mm. making sure that you've got your act together. Um, so there are various ways. I mean, thirdly, you can go along to your bank and have a, ask them. But they will be much more likely to lend to you if you have someone with you that has experience and knows the way it's going. Mm -hmm. So um, you do need to do your research. You need to know your business. You need to produce that business plan. No, none of us that might be investors are expecting a young person to come forward with a wonderfully written business plan that's been put together in every... Because the problem with business plans, they're maps. They're a road map. You plan to go from here to Watford, and you're going to take a certain road. Unfortunately, there's an accident, so you divert. Business is just like that. You create the business plan. Along that road, you will find diversions, and you have to follow those diversions. Um, so a business plan is merely a map. So you don't need to be too detailed about some of it, but you will need to prove to the investor, whether they're a bank, even the crowd, uh, if you go out to crowdfunding, uh, that you have something that's viable. Great. So that's practical. Thank you very much, Stephen. And, and just to the point, um, Sam, I mean, you know, how have you found it in terms of the credibility that you're required to have? I mean, your track record speaks for itself, but yep. still, you know, you, you might have been going to get finance yep. uh, and you're a young man with a big hopes and dreams. What have you found that's been uh, most so effective? Originally, prior to actually coming to... Um, starting up and actually getting the gadgets myself in the UK, I thought, well, maybe I might need actually a loan from the bank to buy more stock from the US and actually be able to buy it in that way. Um, the bank, even with the best um, business studies plan, um, and my teacher said so herself, um, it still doesn't get you funding, unfortunately, because they still look at you as a risk. Um, so as you're saying, someone with the knowledge and experience to actually to be behind you and actually say, um, I can back this and I can vouch this, that this is a good idea, that is always worth having something but being turned down knocking on the door I could have said oh, okay it was worth the try and then just given up then but uh, the drive of an entrepreneur and the determination to sort of say well actually no that's not the only place to get the funding of there must be another way around it and there's lots of ways to be able to get onto the ladder you just got to find the way around it. 
Yeah, and before I come to you, Charlie, on this one, I mean, it is you make a very important point, both of you, I think, that um, there is a lot more options in the marketplace right now. Yeah. I mean, up until a few years ago, there were a couple of routes that you would have needed to go as yeah. an early stage business. Digital technology is providing the kind of crowdfunding, peer-to-peer -peer lending, all of these options. Ex absolutely. I, th I think an important thing for people rem to remember, and I, it's, it's an observation, is that you know when you're going to borrow or you're going to get investors to put money into your business or an investor, I would, if it were me, I would look for the investor that not only is wanting to maybe back you, but is also willing to work with you. Not necessarily a passive investor in the early stages, because if you're not experienced necessarily in every aspect of business life, having someone that's going to put his or her money into your business and be there for the business is more valuable. I would rather have, as a young person starting out, I'd rather have 20, 30,000 quid doing that than 50,000 from someone that's just going to give me the money, because that, those contacts and that advice can be worth half a million quid, not, not 20, you know, for a start going along to a bank and uh, the bank thinking, well, yeah, okay, this is going to work because this person's got a track record and they're going to work with this young person or not so young person. Um, you know, entrepreneurs come in all ages, colours, sexes, sizes, everything. So I met a fantastic entrepreneur in New York not that long ago who was a dwarf and he was a wonderful, true, and he was a fantastic guy. Mm. Uh, we were just checking into a hotel and the family of dwarfs came in and they were really they were just fantastic I know but they were just brilliant people nice. and uh, they were entrepreneurial fantastically entrepreneurial I went out for dinner with them and they were just great right <laughs> so there's one off the wall for you okay <laughs> right we're gonna we're gonna race through after this we're gonna race through a set of questions about uh, and I'd like you to uh, think about between you about when, what do you do when clients don't pay invoices? Uh, I'd like you to think uh, your thoughts, uh, Sam, on why you pick those countries. Greece and Albania don't sound like obvious choices, says uh, one of our um, watchers online. Uh, Charlie, though, to the point to give you your uh, answer on our friend's question yeah. here about raising finance. Um, with a business that doesn't necessarily have a track, rec track record uh, in a climate where you know, many financial institutions are understandably risk averse, um, what, what advice would you give to entrepreneurs? Um, advice? Well, if you go to banks at the moment, evidently f four businesses out of 10 are being turned down for business loans. So you know, very, very difficult uh, with banks at the moment. Um, the, uh, I honestly believe if you are going to go to a bank, you've got to go that you're already, as I've said, making profit and showing that, you know, proving that you're on a winner because a bit of paper means nothing to a bank, you know, you know, other than look at this great idea. The other, I think, also a good way of doing it is if you can put some of your own money in or a friend, family or someone that you know quite closely. And I think if they see you talking with your money and not your mouth, then um, there's a much better chance of doing it. And rightly, as uh, Steve said, there's other places other than banks. Um, you know, there's outside investors, there's, there's family, there's friends, there's people that are close to you. And, and I think to start off a business, you're wasting your time going to a bank to start off, I think, you know, because, you know, it, it's a bit like, you know, they'll lend you an umbrella as long as it ain't raining. OK, let's take, a, let's take another question from the audience and uh, then we'll come to the online one. So who's, uh, who's got next? Yep, the lady here. Um, the microphone there, thank you. Thank you. Um, my question to Orla, um, I'm in the process, as you started, I started the same from house from Attic as a stock and everything. Um, I'm now trying, uh, I find out that my product is very popular in Middle East, in uh, uh, rich Arabic countries. Do you have any connection with them and how you started with them? Because I'm really scared, to be honest, <laughs> by Wikipedia. <laughs> so are you, t you want me to talk about the Middle East yes, particularly? If yes, if you have any connection. What, 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 what is your product? Handbags. Oh, oh, oh lovely. Well yeah, very nice. <laughs> it's actually made of carpet. I mean, in the beginning, when we, were, when we were starting to develop our exports, we, I mean, really, how we started was showing at trade fairs. So, you know, we, we, we at the time did London Fashion Week. We did Premier Class in Paris. 
Yes, are you going to show it who's yeah. next? Yeah. I think that is the way to, to start. And, you, and then I, I think in advance, in, ahead of that, you need to invite as many people as you can to come and visit your stand. And, and to find out who those people are, I would suggest that you join UK Fashion uh, Exports, um, the very, very reasonable UK, price. UK um, yeah, yeah they keep changing their names all the time. <laughs> and uh, the DTI will do reports for you on the Middle East, which are very, very reasonable. Mm -hmm. And they'll focus in on some customers they think would be appropriate for you. Uh, it's a massive market. It's a growing market, the uh, Middle East market. Mm. Uh, always get paid up front uh, when you're working for yourself because don't, you, you don't want to take big risks. You know, so, oh, and they do pay up front in the Middle East, which is great. I, uh, when, when we went in in the beginning, we got paid up front every time for 100%. that particular 100%. Also, the Russian market was very similar. You, you get paid up front. <laughs> um, so Damage, would you say if that's 100% up front before you deliver the goods? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So you don't ship the goods until you get payment. And but don't let them down either. You know, if you take someone's money, make sure you deliver. <laughs> and just uh, and just on this one point, I mean, Stephen's mentioned Stephen's mentioned the BBA, uh, British Bankers Association, as a source of information on finance. Uh, Dermot's mentioned UKTI as a source of information on overseas markets. Actually, but if you want to funnel through to all of those different sources, we we must mention the Business and IP Centre because it, the, the advisors will always be able to point you in the right direction. Oh, okay of which agency can help you but so uh, uh, a good a good point thank you very much good luck with who's next yeah it's good and i i give you um you give me a card afterwards i'll link you yeah, up yeah. with someone just uh, just on this one when we're talking overseas markets a question f uh, uh, from uh, online for you from twitter for you sam how do you did you decide which countries to expand into greece and albania don't sound sound like obvious choices um they definitely don't, and um, the reason for um, the way how our business works is we actually look to provide um, cash injections back into people to be able to have their old gadgets stop depreciating value. So the countries at the moment, especially Greece, is in um, real big trouble with their finance, and we really sort of want to help when put the money back into the market. And it's great for us as well because it's actually bringing the money um, for the gadgets. They're all coming back into the UK, and we're actually really taking advantage of that to actually say um, they are, their currency isn't worth um, as much sort of as their gadgets and they're depre it's depreciating as well. So while we take those gadgets at a, a price, it may not be worth that for them tomorrow. Um, and then also as well, we're able to captivate on actually getting it at such a price. But the reason why we're going into the countries is not just because of it's one I've looked at a map and just randomly pointed at um, when I'm at home at night. It's actually because of the connections I make and sort of um, the people you meet. If you meet someone um, with connections to that country and they've already got interest, it's very interesting. So um, one uh, company that I met, it was a finance company um, who were in Greece, um, and he said about how he just launched his service over there, completely unrelated to our business. But then he said how well it was doing, and it's learning from other people's success and watching the news, watching TV, and sort of seeing how people are doing and how well they're doing in countries where you can actually say, well, it's, it's completely different, um, but mm. I can actually try my business in that country myself and see how it goes. So that's how I kind of pick and choose where we're going to go, just on other people's success. And if I hear there's success over there, then it could be an opportunity for me as well. Great stuff. Thank you very much, Sam. OK, who's got our next question? I feel as if I've been a bit unfair to the back of the room. So if there's uh, anyone at the back of the room... Oh, yeah, there's a lady there in the, in the middle with her hand up there. Hi. Um, so the question mainly for Sam, but uh, if other people can answer it too, that's great. Um, I was just curious how you managed to get the word out to so many customers so quickly to make mm. you know a million pounds in the first year. Mm. It's a great. It's a great question because of course it's uh, big. It brings us onto the whole subject of social media and yep. and the power of, uh, of such like. Um, it was really the service that I was providing. It was something unique. It was something very different. Um, and it was just word of mouth. I provided excellent service every single time. So I actually would phone up the customers personally and make sure everything was okay and adding that personal touch to it. Um, and we try and keep that personal touch even when the company is so big, calling people up and checking that um, everything's okay with how it, how it went. And that really, that sort of extra touch, that added value um, that you add to the customer service, 
people. So that was on top of presumably a lot of that. thought about you know, using Twitter, using Facebook and the like. Yeah. Just share some of what's worked best for you in the social media arena. Um, social media, um, with, it was definitely well following up on customers, but then it was as well, um, being sort of the age of where I'm using social media websites, I knew exactly how to communicate with friends. So I tried those techniques of actually communicating with customers as well on promotions of what I was offering. Um, one promotion that we've run before is a um, Facebook competition where if you... Um, join the application, um, and you could have a chance to win uh, eight eight thousand. Uh, sorry, you could have a chance to win an iPhone four. And um, that was when it was first released. Um, we sent this competition. I thought nothing of it. Um, came back the next day, and we had eight thousand people who had signed up through our website just because we're giving away an iPhone four. So it's amazing, especially uni students, what they'll do just to get like a free iPhone. Um, and that was really what I used to my advantage. So for me, it was really asking friends and family, especially friends as well, from them being the cheap people they are at uni, um, looking to get things at the best deal. Um, to ask them, say, what do you think of this idea? And they are very, very blunt with me. Um, I could say to my friends, what do you think of this idea? If they think it's rubbish, they will throw it back in my face. But not just throw it back in my face, they will push it back in my face big time. So yeah. it's people like that who are supporting you and people like that who motivate me to thought, sort of say, yeah, let's get this going. Right. So, but you would say on specifically competitions can work really competitions well. Competitions can from, work extremely well from yeah. past experience, yes. Great. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, question down here at the front. Sorry, Claire, making you run up and down. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. um, what would you say if the benefits, the outcomes of your business was more of a social enterprise and wasn't quantifiable in pounds and pence, and you're looking at the social benefits of communities, the behaviour, education, creating employment. Mm -hmm. um, how do you quantify that to an investor to get them on board without having a yeah. financial sort of return? Yeah, it's a big, it's a big issue. Anybody, anybody got any, I mean, you know, you're all running commercial businesses, not necessarily yeah. social enterprises, but anybody got any, who's got yeah, some I thoughts think on... I, I've got, I know uh, where you're coming from with this, with this question. I actually think that most well-run, well-thought-out businesses along the John Lewis model, and I'm going to say that again, mm -hmm. are actually social enterprises anyway. They create massive opportunities for employees. They create massive opportunities for the... You're able to buy good products, rely on the company, and all, all of that. So I do think that a well-run commercial enterprise is a social enterprise. But I know where you're coming from with the specific question, and that's, uh, that's what you want answered so that's mm. what I'll try to answer now and that is where you don't see it as a vision of anyone making any profit uh, and so so why would an investor invest well if I were trying to focus on that particular line I would be looking for an investor or a group of investors that had a similar similar vision to me so let's say, as an example, that I, I, I don't know, you know, I, I wanted to make the planet completely green. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would look for people that have those similar, uh, th th that are in a better financial position than I am, mm -hmm. that have those similar views. There are st quite a few around the world, um, individuals. And there, and there are, I mean, again, to go yeah. back to referencing the British Library here as well, there are sources of funding specifically, and there are funds for yeah. social enterprises. Um, and those would, you know, to Stephen's points, those would look at a business proposal, which was one which had social outcomes rather than commercial outcomes, and would assess the viability of that, and probably give you just as tough a time as a commercial lender, but with questions about the social outcomes. But if you have the same beliefs, it's not like anything in life, if you have, have similar beliefs, you have more chance of moving it forward. Um, I actually think business itself is a social enterprise when ran properly. So that's where I am with it. Great, great. Okay, let's uh, keep the questions flowing. Anybody um, else there? Um, there's a question down here in the second row, please. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, is there anything over the last I don't know, 20 years or so, obviously not including some, that you'd change about your business in terms of sort of, I don't know, something you would have done looking back and everyone's got 2020 vision in hindsight as the saying goes, but is there anything in explicitly that you would change? Because obviously there's a lot of 
that want to be and would be entrepreneurs here? Is there anything you'd change explicitly? Like a decision that, uh, that um, had an important yeah, in terms impact of on the business? In terms of a new possible like buyouts or anything you decision you made years ago that you, if you went back, you would think, oh, I wish I'd done that differently. Any? Mm. I suspect that we won't get much regret around the panel, <laughs> but um, let's, let's have a, uh, Charlie. Uh, well, for myself, I think um, uh, if I sort of would have realised that, you know, you can be successful, you know, with, with a degree and without sort of a great education, as it's been mentioned, and as much as you can with them, um, I would have sort of, you know, if I, if I sort of had could see, or we, if we all had a crystal ball, I suppose, we, we would have all changed things. But, you know, I sort of felt I could do everything myself. And, and you know, it's probably only in the last sort of 15 years that, I've learned to sort of delegate and, uh, you know, trust people that, um, you know, people are good at their job. So for me, um, I should have delegated uh, earlier and uh, put a better structure in place. And uh, I think without a structure in, in anything you do, uh, you can't be successful. So that's what I would have. Uh, we obviously have it in place now, but, uh, you know, I just wish we would have done it years ago. Is there anything, Dermot, about the, the, the shape of the business and the way that you've organize it over the past years that you, you look back on and you think you'd like to change? I think there's things that, that I would say that I, we're lucky we didn't do certain okay. things. Okay. And I do think for us, one of the things in the fashion industry, it's a very easy option for, for people to take on investment early on. Right. And I think we were always very mindful of that in the beginning. So, mm. you know, we're one of the few companies now that you know, are one hundred percent in control of our business, mm. and it would have been it would have been very easy. And I have so many, com you know, friends and acquaintances mm. in the industry who have who ha had taken on investment early early on, and have lost their businesses. Yes. You know, they've lost the, they've lost their name. They can't. You know, they've had to walk away. Mm. So I think the, I just think we were very lucky that we kind of stuck to our guns. Yeah, it's a very powerful message. Thank mm. you. Um, okay, let's uh, move on. I just want to, there's one very specific question which uh, I suspect we might get some robust answers to. Uh, what happens if your invoices are not being paid? What do you do? I'm going to ask you, Stephen, that, and then I'm going to ask you, Charlie. Send that. the boys that no. <laughs> um, I, uh, it's, a, it's a good question from an early stage businesses that are going to be tight on cash, yes. and uh, we all know that the, yeah. the tricks that can be played. Yeah, okay. I, I, for me, I think it's uh, this. I think you have to not let the bills run away with themselves. If you have a customer that's showing signs of not paying, then rec don't let them keep running up next month, and again they don't pay, and then again they don't pay. Because if they can't pay the £3,000 bill, they're not going to be able to pay the £9,000 bill down the road. Mm -hmm. So make sure you stamp on that very early by gently talking to them. You might need to give them some leeway. We recently had someone that owed us uh, some money <coughs> and in one of our businesses, and the immediate feeling was, let's get a hold of them, they need to pay up. Um, but we managed it gently and uh, did ring, did follow up, did chase up, and actually four or five days later, they got paid by someone else, and indeed they did pay this one of this business of ours. Mm. So I think you do need to put pressure on, but you don't need to be nasty about it, especially initially. Uh, I, I, you know, no one really wants people, you don't need to do that. If you do it early enough, you might be okay. Um, let it run on, you probably won't be okay. Yeah. So get in early is my answer. Quick thought on that, Charlie? Yeah. Um, well, I think you've, you've obviously got to have a plan in place and whatever your terms and conditions are, um, make it clear to the customer. And uh, if they don't stick to it, then don't do business with them. Yeah. We're fortunate. We, we, our uh, arrangement is it's payment on completion of works. And, um, you know, so cash flow is okay on that. And we don't work for anybody that can't pay us. If the Queen rang us tomorrow and she can't, pay us by cheque or credit card, we don't work for her. But that doesn't work for every she business. She's got a checkbook. Um, all, all I'm saying is, is lay out your terms before you start. And very much as, as it's been said here, is, is stick to what your terms are. And um, rightly as they say, if they don't pay, then uh, don't, I mean, we have a few accounts with people, very much on a 30 days. And uh, if they don't pay up, we stop work immediately for them and uh, 
for me, it works for us, but every business is different. Great stuff. Okay, so from a very, um, uh, that's a very specific question, thank you for your um, answers, to a, a bigger, wider one, um, which um, I might give to one of you now and we might pick up at the end. This is, and this is from, uh, on, from Twitter, uh, at Nanny Network. Um, have any of the panellists felt that being an entrepreneur is a lonely journey? I suspect the answer to that is yes. More relevantly, if so, if so how did you overcome this? There are clearly moments when... This is a, uh, a difficult journey that you set yourselves on. Um, who would like to just... Let's just get one answer to begin with on this, and then we'll maybe pick it up at the end. We, Dermot and We Orla. got nominated for the um, Entrepreneur of the Year Award with Ernst & Young, and it actually turned out to be a club of entrepreneurs of people like us. Mm. And I, I found that really enjoyable, mm. spending time with these guys and just talking to them and realising that actually you're not on your own. But that, that's when you were established and that's mm. when you were able to tap into that network. It may be that the, uh, the person asking this question might not have access to those networks and is pushing and driving a business that mm. he or she wants to succeed uh, in, those, in those days when you haven't got the, that you network around you. Yeah, it turns, as, you know, a mentor would make a hell of a difference in the beginning. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I've got a lonely one. Um, when I first started uh, my business, I, when I was, let's say, 15, because I used the coin box as my office for quite some time, um, and I used to hang an out-of-order sign on the phone box so no, one <laughs> I, so no one else could use it. And uh, uh, I used to sit in the rain, often in the rain, because it always seemed to be raining, uh, outside the phone box on a wooden seat for hours under an umbrella waiting for the people in the States to ring me. And... Uh, Believe you me, when you've sat there in the rain for four or five hours mm. outside a phone box waiting for somebody in New Jersey who is almost certainly, a were, they were, multi-millionaires, and I'm on a council estate with an umbrella, it can get lonely. Mm. Um, I've got no idea why I never gave up. Um, I've got no idea. I just didn't. I just used to sit there. But there were lonely times, you know. It's raining, you're cold, you're damp. Mm. And uh, you didn't the phone. <laughs> yeah, and the, no, and then yeah. and not only that, fending off people mm. as well that are coming along saying, "Why is that a border?" And you've got to say, uh, "Don't know. Why mm. are you sitting there in the rain with that umbrella?" Uh, mm. Don't say anything. You know, it's you've got to do all those things. A lonely day, but mm. eventually the phone rings and you move on, don't you? You know, and suddenly things happen. Uh, it's like uh, buses; they all come in threes, and suddenly you're off. Yeah. What do you so, feel? No, no, I mean, I, it is. There, there, when things, you know, when you've setbacks, it can be. It can mm -hmm. be. But, you know, it's always, yeah, you know, you can be kind of most proactive sometimes mm -hmm. when you have, you know, kind of lonely moments. I mm -hmm. think when you have to really start thinking how can you kind of move things on or turn things yeah. around or And whatever. it's interesting that all of you, in one way or another, have mentioned, you know, family and the support of family and support. being family mm -hmm. businesses, and the two of you work together. And it is something that comes up a lot at these events, mm -hmm. that it need not be a solitary experience. You know, you can work with others and, and, and make sure you can have a close team around you that can yeah. offer that mm. support at those perhaps bleak times. But it's one of the things, though, Matthew, it's very important to... Sorry, one of the things is very important, I think, to be uh, have passion for your business because when you get lonely, and you will get those lonely days, you've made that application for a bank loan and you didn't get it. You went to the investors and they weren't interested. And it's raining and it's miserable and your girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife left you. All of a sudden, you know, you're there. But if you've got passion, you don't want to... Because there will come times when you want to get... A, you know, in the morning, you've got to be at work at 8 o'clock. And if you don't like your business, you're only in it for the money. If you're only in it for the money you think, oh, I don't really want to go in. But if there's a passion behind that business, you'll go in anyway. Um, you know, I mean, I would go into... I would, someone said to me the other day, here tonight, you know, when are you going to retire? And my answer to that is I am retired. Because retirement means you do every day what you want to do. Mm. And I do every day what I want to do. Mm. I, first time I retired, I was 27. And as my son, who's here tonight, would tell you, it lasted three weeks. <laughs> I got, a, you know, I had everything I wanted. I had the house and the car and everything I wanted. And I thought, I, I don't need this anymore. I was lonely. I was really lonely because after about 10 days or a couple of weeks, didn't have anyone to talk to. Mm. 
Who wanted to talk about golf? Sorry, I'm, some of you might be... <laughs> but I didn't. You know, I wanted to talk about business. Yeah. So there you go. Great stuff. It's an interesting question. OK, um, who else has got... A couple of questions here. So the gentleman here and the lady here. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Uh, this is sort of a specific question, but it does open up into a wider one about branding. Uh, just a qu quick bit of background to explain the question. I'm currently involved in a, in a, in a business startup around sport, and it's uh, the concept, without giving too much away, is an online resource only. So we've been exploring the name of the of the business started to give it an actual identity. And we had a brainstorming session, came up with three or four names, thought, fantastic. We then went and searched them and found they'd been bought up but weren't in use. So we did the usual thing, approached the broker, whoever the company was, and we got quoted silly money, 15,000 pounds, 100,000 pounds, or you know, pay 20 pounds and we'll get back to you. So it's, it's getting a bit of an issue. Now, the question we wondered, is whether, in terms of a brand, and particularly an online one, how important it is to have an identity and the domain name and the company name that suggests mm. that's what you're doing, or an inkling, or whether you can go, you know, n you know, pretty much to a random name to get yeah. around this, you know, this situation. Yes, exactly. I mean, Zoopla. What does that mean? You know, mm. but it's made an incredible impact. Yeah, Sam, what do you think about this? Because your name kind of says what it does. Yeah, we're definitely online, um, and we're just 100 percent online. So coming up for my brand name, um, it, it was just something that came to me. It's not something that's anything to do with recycling. Gadgets for everyone. It means nothing to do with recycling anything. Really, it sounds like you're buying gadgets from us, but. Actually, what we've managed to do is actually have the reputation of that brand, and now we're known on the internet, and actually um, people are aware of that brand. So, but did you ever think about uh, going for one of those? You know, oh, I, I definitely did. Internet names, with whatever regards they may to be. Um, going into a little technical information with um, search engine optimization, with the name you choose, it is extremely important. If you get your keywords into your domain name, then that's going to really help you actually market your business online. Um, and that is one thing that obviously we don't get the advantage of. For example, for me, I could have had a website called, a company name called um, Sell Your Gadgets. That would have been absolutely perfect for us because it's saying exactly what we do and it's actually the keyword of what people will be searching online. Mm. So picking your brand name is in, online um, compared to retail, I think, is 10 times more important because you've got to consider the factors of not just what it's called, but what that actually does with regards to how you're going to market your website. Why didn't you go for sell your gadgets? Because it's taken, so. And, uh, <laughs> and how much, and how much would it have cost you uh, to buy it? Thousands of pounds, because people, right. people are aware they will buy these names up, and as you said, they are aware of their value, and that's mm. why they have bought these names up already. Mm. Mm. So it's an interesting, mm. it's, it's, a, it's a good question. It's, an in, it's a difficult mm. one to answer without looking at the actual specific circumstances of, you know, what it might cost and what the market opportunity is and et cetera, et cetera. But brands are never instant. I mean, they do take time to establish. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, by the time they're established, yeah. I suppose, and you know, it doesn't use Zoopla as a good example. Yeah. Try the brand fear. You know? Yeah. That's us. Um, I mean, you know, what, you know, you ring up, people ring up who you, fear, sorry. Yeah. But the reality of it is that is right. Yeah. ICI, you know, what did that mean? You know, I mean, AstraZeneca, to most people that don't study Latin, what does it mean? Apple. Apple. Yes. You know, so I do. But I do think there's a merit to doing what it says on the tin. Mm -hmm. I think you need that in a strap line somewhere. Mm -hmm. So if you have, you know, ICI, you might have something about chemicals immediately under it. I think it's a good idea to tell people what you do. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely. Without yeah. any question. So don't ask me about fear again. <laughs> I'll just add something there, Steve. Yeah. Um, I think branding is unbelievably important, and rightly, as we say, if, you, if, if in your company name you could be saying what you do, it's a massive advantage, and um, I think a lot of people go wrong with, with their names because people haven't got a clue what they do, and it uh, makes it very, very difficult. You can, you can actually be the best company in the world, but if people don't know about you or don't recognise you, then you know, you're no big deal out there. Mm. So for me, name of a company and branding is unbelievably important in any business. Yeah. I can never understand why the post office changed their name that time. Do you, what did they change yeah. it to? Oh, yes, Cognetas. I yeah, I mean, it was, yeah. Cognetas. Why would yeah. you change the post yeah. office? Why would you change it to something like that? Ridiculous. Question here. Um, how important was licensing in growing your business, Orla and Dermot, and how does the process actually work? I'd say licensing has been something we, we started doing about four years ago. And 
I think for us it's wor it works, and it's a good it's a good way to to expand without kind of being responsible for all the stock, and I think that's really quite important. So we are very careful who we work with, and I think we have learned in the very early days we learned the hard way, and now we are absolutely selective about who we work with and we are very careful with contracts and we make sure that we have absolute total approval on everything or else it doesn't go into production. But I do think it opens up lots and lots of opportunities in a way for us. So yeah, it's been, it's been, it's been so far, it's been great. Mm. We, we also have very good experience working with, with other people and, and bringing a professional uh, design product to them. And it's about a marriage. It's about finding someone that you can get on with. And it's very much a personal chemistry thing. If, if you can work with a company or a team of people and you understand each other, it can go very, very easily and be very successful. But very um, importantly, we design everything. You know, a lot of license agreements are where their company will design mm. the product offer, yeah. so, you know, and, they sh and show it to us. We, we generate everything. Mm. Yeah. So that in that way, we have control. Yeah. Yeah. How important is, um, is manufacturing in China to you? Do you it's, it's part of it, but it's not, it's not our main production, mm. you know, I mean, our homeware, our homeware is done in Portugal, for example. Uh, recently, our uh, production has been moving back to Europe and uh, to Portugal, and, and we're actually manufacturing in Britain as well. Mm. And uh, it's currency-related as much as anything else. The reason we stopped manufacturing in Britain was when the pound went up. And um, now that it's come back down, we can, we can manufacture here. Mm. Oh, yeah, we do still manufacture in China, and the, the factories we work with are... Or, um, you know, their quality is amazing. Mm. Mm. Thank you very much. I think the gentleman just behind, did you have a question? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we've answered it. There's a gentleman over here. We've probably got time for a couple more. That Hello. Um, just wanted to ask, um, barriers of entry. Have any of you experienced any barriers of entry and how did you overcome it? Barriers to entry into... In terms of the industry that you're in, were you ever in a position where someone bigger than you is trying to stop you from actually getting in. Right, right. Any, any experience mm. on that? I think, I think the most relevant thing to do with barriers of entry is that if your barrier is too low, there will be too many people in the market. Mm. Uh, as an example, we, uh, you know, we're involved with a business that um, used cladding, guttering for buildings, down pipes and things. And the business was really struggling. And a, a friend of mine who's a, a banker had invested in it, and he rang me and said, what do you think of it? And I said, well, it's rubbish. Um, the business model is rubbish. It's being ran badly. Uh, everything about it is bad. And the barrier, the reason, because anyone with two or 300 quid can go out and buy the product and start that business by knocking on doors. So the barrier is low in that case. Where you've got a business that's being attacked by... We ha also had a business uh, at the time was called European Discount. And we struggled in competition with that particular business because of the big B&Qs and people that were selling similar product. They just dropped their price locally so that we were uncompetitive. And you have to face the fact that, you know, if you're, um, if you're a, a, a deer and a lion comes into the jungle, you better to get out and go to another jungle. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to move to another jungle. <laughs> The, the, yeah, animal, just the, the, the animal is. stories are flowing thick and fast tonight, yeah. Stephen. I'm a great, yeah, well, that's because I'm a great lover of Africa. I, I, <laughs> and the fear I ones. All my decors in Africa. They, yes. go, they go well with the fear ones. Yes. Uh, there was another question near the front. Yes, um, a gentleman at the front, and then there's probably time for one more. Um, what's the most important factor in making a successful business? So it's a great question to answer, uh, to end with, although I've, I've guaranteed... Oh, why don't we take the question from the uh, gentleman uh, two rows behind, um, and we'll see which one's best. We'll enter it. <laughs> That's unfair, no. Um, in your opinion, what is an entrepreneur? Is it just someone who simply starts a business, or is there more to it? Are there certain characteristics or personality traits that you find as well? Okay. 
actually they do kind of fit together a bit here don't they there's the there's your point about uh, you know what yeah as you put it what is a, uh, an entrepreneur is it just the starting up or is it more to it and then yeah i mean a very big but important question about uh, what makes a success in business can i just um with this uh, add on to this and, and this is for your concluding thoughts therefore we have a, a question online about um from uh, I support parents to develop their children's entrepreneurial potential. What advice would you give parents helping four to fourteen-year-olds with regards to this? So we've got a question about what makes a success in business, characteristics of an entrepreneur, and um, helping parent parents develop entrepreneurial potential. I know that's a lot to wrap into one question, which is why I'm wishing on to give you a chance to, to, to think about it. Um, Charlie, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, the first one was what makes a successful business, was it, from this chat? Yeah, that's the most important thing. Sorry? What's the most important factor to make a successful business? Um, again, all businesses are, are different, and I'm sure there's different factors, but from air business, and I believe this also works for a lot of other businesses, um, it's all about quality of service or quality of product. It's all about, you know, what, you, what you're offering, um, you know, how good it is. You know, people will always pay for quality. And, and that's sort of for, for my answer, I suppose. Yeah, great. And, and what about this, this other one about getting parents and to the point about, you know, what the characteristics of an entrepreneur. If you, to nurture a bit of entrepreneurial spirit in very young, ki in young kids, what would be your thoughts there, Charlie? Um, I suppose really just sort of, um, what would I say, you know, where you're sort of inspiring somebody, giving them confidence and uh, letting them believe in themselves, you know, because, you know, I realise now that, um, you know, there's no set pattern for an entrepreneur. It, it can be all in anybody. And it's really just about someone giving someone confidence and telling them they can succeed and uh, believing in it. Mm -hmm. Stephen? Belief. I think the important thing... Uh, especially in young kids, um, and uh, is, to, is to help them believe that you can achieve anything if you set your mind to it, because you really can. I mean, I started with absolutely nothing. I started on a council estate with no contacts, no knowledge, no one, no banker. I used a trustee savings account until I was 17 because I didn't know how to open a bank account. So when you start in that way, it's about... Uh, supporting and making and helping young people understand that you can really succeed. You do not have to accept the mediocrity that is dished out by some people. Everything is there to do. You've got communications, you've got fantastic support. Uh, there is a lot of free advice out there, including at the British Library, of course, here. We give a lot of free advice and try to support people. But it's belief. Charlie's right. It's about being inspirational and helping that person, the young person, believe they can do it. Because if you don't believe, you'll never have a go. And you know what? If you try hard enough and long enough, you will succeed, whatever they, whoever they are, say. Mm, great. That's my answer. Sam? Uh, for me, I think it's just ambition and drive of exactly where you want to go um, in life. For me, I just want to um, make it as big as possible. And it's for me, it's kind of the people who say, this is the route to go down. Um, for example, you have to go to university. You, this is the standard route. I want to try and break the mould and say, well, actually, for me, that's not the way that I want to go forward. And I want to actually make my own business. I want to do things that are unheard of. And it's just that drive and ambition to actually do things that people normally it wouldn't be achievable but just because you've set your mind to it and if you're so focused on something you will eventually achieve it mm. do you mind if i just say one thing sure. sorry yeah. it's only quickly uh, i think the thing about age and i don't know how old are you 14 i think that's an amazing thing sorry what's your name jamie, jamie. that's an amazing thing because it's not to do with how old you are it's how good you are if you're wayne rooney and you're 17 you don't not play for England because you're 17. Uh, if you're young enough, if, you're, you know, if you can do it, if you have an idea, you can achieve it. And that goes for people that have never done it who are 60. Mm. They can also do it. It is out there to be done. Mm. And that's a very important point, actually, isn't it? It's at both ends of the spectrum. It's important to communicate to young people, you know, like Jamie here, but equally to those whose lives are 
changing in this time of change. If you're totally. you know, 60 years old and never run a business, there's still plenty of support for you. Yeah, there is. I mean, people, it doesn't matter about how old you are. It's what we said really earlier. You know, it doesn't matter how old you are, who you are, from what background you come. No one's interested. The market doesn't care about whether you've got nine legs, one leg, three legs, or mm. no, it doesn't matter. I've got people in, that come to me from Heropreneurs, you know, the military charity, and some of them have been badly damaged by in war zone. Great entrepreneurs. They understand the turning up on time. Because that's one thing about anyone that's going to be successful as an entrepreneur. You have to turn up. It's no good being a genius and not turning up. You've got to turn up. You know, that's it. That would be my message. Excellent. I, I, Orla, yeah, no, I'm just going word. to add, very simply, I think to be alongside belief and passion and all those things... I think to be a doer is a really good thing, not just somebody who thinks, but, but you know, to actually do it. And I also think to be a finisher, because I think there are so many people who start things, but they don't know how to follow through and finish. And I think that is really important, especially for kids, to try and teach children the process, where to start and where to finish. And that's really important. For Brilliant. Me. Brilliant. Well, it's a fantastic way to close uh, this discussion, um, to close the online uh, webcast. And uh, apologies to those of you whose questions we weren't able to get. I believe we've covered a lot of them. Some were very detailed, so um, my apologies. But we'll try and address some of those uh, online outside this evening. Thank you for all your questions, Charlie, uh, Dermot, Orla, Sam, Stephen. Thank you very much. Fantastic occasion. Thank you. Thank you.